Hi, everyone. Hey, Ben. That works. Josh, are you doing that? Okay, good. Thanks. Come on in or hush up. Is there a special show up? I think there is, but I don't know what it is because I, I saw a headline about what was under it. I love the Phillips. I do too. Great. Yeah, really nice. Nice size. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Ted Parson Memorial How Should This Planet Be Steered panel, <laughs> um, otherwise known as The Path Forward. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panel because I think A, its name um, introduces itself, and B, um, I think we're going to define what this panel's about in the, in the doing of it rather than in prospect. Um, I'm Oliver Morton. I'm down on your um, I'm down on your uh, programs as the as a, an editor at the Economist, which is indeed something that I am. But I'm here more in the in the context of being someone who's written about this subject and still has a sort of like interest in it through the uh, UCL Steep program. Um, we have an excellent panel here. We're going to divide it into two parts. We're going to have three presentations um, first, which will have slides for your um, visual um, delectation. And then we're going to have a first sort of like go round at talking about those things that we've heard. Then we're going to pull it back in with some unslided, but nevertheless utterly fascinating um, remarks from Andrew and Jane. And then we're going to go all big and inclusive and talking about it all uh, with you and the roving mics. So on that note, um, our first speaker is um, my friend Kelly Wanzo. I say that, in fact, they're all my friends. So um, that probably makes it all sound too chummy and very um, incestuous. But anyway, there we go. Um, Kelly is uh, an entrepreneur in the Bay Area. She's been personally involved in trying to push forward the marine cloud brightening idea for at least eight years um, and possibly longer. Uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about her view of um, Paths forward through technology and innovation, and I don't think we do want to perform auto HV keystone keystroke cor correction. I'm pretty sure we don't want to do that. So, Kelly. Yes. Um, and, and should I make a beep then, or do I switch? Oh, I should also remind, so tell everyone that um, Rebecca's uh, dog is back in business. <laughs> okay. Come on. Um, Seriously. So while, while they're setting up the slides, um, so I am indeed Kelly Wanzer. I hail from the technology industry for about 20 years. Um, and uh, so I'm going to bring a little bit different perspective in thinking about uh, geoengineering and the climate system. And so looking at it as we might look at a whole systems problem in some big areas of science. And this trails on a lot of the work that Jane Long does. And I was, in fact, hoping to talk after her rather than for her about mission-driven science and how, how you might think about what those research programs look like and um, what the sort of umbrella rubric is that they operate in. So the climate system is one of the more complex systems that you can face. And the challenge that, one of the challenges we're trying to solve is that we have anthropogenic stressors that are changing the system potentially in irreversible ways. And so from one perspective, we're here talking about can we relieve one major stressor, which is heat. And I work with Sarah Cooley um, from Ocean Conservancy on a project, an emerging project, to look at ocean systems and accelerate the understanding from a system science perspective. And heat is one of the major stressors on the ocean and ocean ecosystems. And so if you look at something like uh, solar climate engineering and moon cloud brightening in that context, you have ecosystems like coral reefs where localized geoengineering might make a difference in terms of heat stress on those coral reefs as one way to look at this sort of system effects. So uh, beep. Um, so when we talk about a whole system approach, and I'll just have you populate the slide to actually get it. Um, but when we think about a whole systems approach and mission-driven science, you know, and, and I use these as an example, right? My opinion only, but an example framework for how we might think about things. So if one of our missions is we have a ta time-bound problem on the system, we don't know what that time-bounding is, but there might be something that we want to achieve in terms of information and readiness in a certain period of time. That could be 50 years, that could be 20 years, that could be 10 years. And so have we defined, you know, in, in this category, in terms of our portfolio of ways to address the system, what is the information and what are the readiness options that we might like to have available? 
And then in that context, if we said to ourselves that within 20 years, we would like to have process level information about these alternatives in terms of feasibility, input to climate models, and some form of readiness around some of the technical tools we might need as an example. And then along with that, we would say, well, then what is the end user vision of the system that we would want? And this isn't specific to any particular technique. In, in fact, it could be a portfolio of techniques that include solar climate engineering and other things. But what we're talking about is some context for managed reduction of solar radiative forcing. And I use the term managed very specifically because that implies uh, some system structures around it. And so an example for some requirements of a system like this, and again, we can talk about what these requirements are, but thinking about what some of them might look like. One is we want to optimize the types of particles that we're using. And in particular, we'd like them to be benign with respect to atmospheric chemistry. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we need scalable operation of the climate systems, and I'm calling real-time state information, but we need aggregated process information about what's actually happening to the climate system when we do it, ideally. And then, if he, and then I'm calling this the coupled human system. So that's the technical side of the system, and we have the coupled human system. And there are lots of, there's an array of requirements we might think about here, but just in terms of some, a couple of the high level things we might like to have is a policy and legal framework that are pragmatic for the knowledge and state of readiness that we're trying to achieve and public and stakeholder support so that we're not, that we're not moving forward without it. Just as examples of things we might want for the human system. Beep. And tell what generation I am because I really love the beep. Um, so a system like this, um, and this actually has some gold functions to fold it out. But one of the things in a, in a mission-driven uh, research program is we have an array, and what you're seeing here is kind of my conception of scale from tiny particle research all the way to global impacts and all the way up to human systems. And the array of sort of interdisciplinary research efforts where we're dealing with many novel questions in the silos of research. And we're trying to do that in a coordinated way to hit whatever that target is, that 20 year, 10 year, or 50 year target, to move these things along and it hits to that question of whether you're going parallel or serial. So if I wait until I have a spray system for five or 10 years, and I wait until I have a good governance model for another 10 years, then you know, I have this array of things going on, which I'm, I'm happy to talk people through later. But that, that's a sort of picture of you know, the kinds of silos of research we'd actually like to kick up in parallel because in most of those tracks, there are showstoppers, I would argue. And I would rather carry those on and figure out if those showstoppers are there. Are we going to need alternatives as we go in parallel? Um, so then, uh, beep. so I want to talk about two examples of requirements for a system like S3, actually. And the first, and, and this is about our state of readiness against this notional timeline that we set up. So one is benign materials for perturbing the atmosphere. The state of the art today is sulfates, and that's true in the troposphere, and that's true in the stratosphere. And having uh, worked with a team in marine cloud lightning, engineering the type of aerosols that you want, with the properties that you want, to do the things that you want to do, is a hard problem at this scale. Um, and David's super smart, so he might solve it faster than mo most humans alive. But it's a hard problem, and we don't have that today. Um, the real-time system state problem, you heard me refer to before about observational platforms and models. We have silos of data produced in bifurcated ways, in, in layers. Um, I'm going to have to move forward one. Um, this is an example of some work that if Amanda's here, the National Academy of Science is doing on sustained ocean observations. So they're running a workshop program on ideally what, what layers of information would we like to have to observe the ocean state continuously. This is a big set of information, most of which we don't have today. And then once I have the collection of that data, how am I processing and modeling that data? And so what, what we're talking about is a pretty big scale of data gathering, data operation, in order to achieve the kinds of feedback information that you would really want to have if you were having a system that's perturbing the atmosphere intentionally. Now, the beauty of this, and the reason I advocate for maintaining whatever platforms that we have, and the dog is barking, so this is my last note. Um, the beauty of this is this is fine-grained information on climate, 
analyzing what is happening. Okay, to how the does bloody system. know? <laughs> Stop. There we go. So, uh, so, so, the, so the beauty of this is that you know the kind of system. If you're doing whole systems thinking about the kind of information that, that you want to have, it maps to precisely the information you want to have about to, about managing the inadvertent climate impacts that we're making. And so, so I'm, I'm encouraging this whole system thinking out of the disciplines move forward rapidly in parallel, as long as it's safe, so that we can uh, coalesce that information and think really hard about the timelines that we, that we want to reach. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. You. Uh, next, I'm going to turn to Peter. Um, Peter Kareva um, is the director of the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA and used to be at the Nature Conservancy, and thinks a lot about uh, how climate and other environmental issues fit into broader social ima public imagining of things. So, Peter. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of an orthogonal approach. I'm going to draw on some personal experience that you might remember the very first field release of GMOs. That was in 1987 in Northern California, and I did a risk assessment of that. 30 years later, I was on the National Academy Committee to, to sort of summarize everything we learned and project forward to the future prospects for GMOs. And there's a lot you can learn from that history of involvement for the topic before us today, uh, geoengineering. So let me talk about some of the sort of lessons. First off, before that first field trial, 12 years before in 1975, there's a conference at Asilomar by molecular biologists. Without any government, the scientists set up guidelines for how to do the, the, the experiments and the field experiments. And those guidelines are still guide us very much today. Some of the other lessons is it's different, it's different than the geoengineering because there was corporations and private gain to be made. But some of the mistakes that were made speak to mistakes that we have to avert with geoengineering. One was there was a reluctance to deal with basic ethical questions. They just wanted to deal with the scientific issues. The, the, in the, many of the meetings like this avoided the ethics. The other one was sort of the arrogance of the scientist, especially in engaging the public. The arrogance would be either we, we, impatience with explaining it with the assumption the public couldn't possibly understand or proposing grandiose things like the GMO crops were gonna solve world hunger. A third thing that was really obvious early on was a failure to deal with who loses? What happens in developing nations? What happens to the small farmers? So while the, the, the GMO biotechnology you know, had the grand picture of world food production, it didn't pay enough attention to the disadvantage and who loses. And certainly it had issues of secrecy, in this case because of patents. One of the things it did right is it did have publicly funded risk assessment, and that scientists doing the risk assessment did not have an interest in promoting the field trials. So I was one of those scientists doing the risk assessment. Another thing it got right, there was an earlier discussion uh, today, this, uh, this morning, about once you commit to a field trial, does that mean you're committing to implementation? There are good examples from biotechnology where it wasn't. A good example of that is because in the, in a, to get a permit for the field trial, you had to basically predict the outcome of the field trial. There was permitting for farmer crops, putting drugs into things like corn, and they predicted it could be contained. They did field trials with corn and farmer crops. They could not be contained. That whole pathway for commercial development was shut down. So the field trial and the results of the field trial actually shut down uh, a major commercial enterprise. But the biggest failure of biotech and its uh, risk assessment and that whole scenario, and the legacy lives of it with us today, and I really saw that with the National Academy report we did last year, is it didn't frame the problem correctly the way society wanted it framed. In other words, it was just about yields and maybe profitability to farmers, when actually what society wanted to be framed was obvious in the questions we were asked when we were doing the committee report was, What's the trajectory of the world's food production systems with GM crops compared to the trajectory of the world's production systems without GM crops? That was the question people wanted to have answered. And all that investment had not addressed that question. And it would, you know, that's an absolutely, it's what's the trajectory of the world's climate futures with and without? And I think that's a fundamental question. If you don't start answering it right away, it's a big mistake. 
And the last thing I want to end on is another lesson that I learned from that that I think pertains especially in the climate arena. You know, we talk about the climate arena. We use things like uncertainty analysis. We do economics and cost-benefit analysis, economic costs. Uh, they did all that with biotech. Again, uh, it didn't speak to the public concerns. Instead, what is needed, what I call advanced counting. So by advanced counting, what I mean is what you really want to know is for something like extreme events. The floods we just had in Los Angeles. You want to say, that was a 100-year flood. Well, given recent trends and climate trends, it's now a one in every 20-year flood. That's advanced counting. You want to do uncertainty? It's between a one in every five year and a one in every 30 year flood. And if we can take our climate, and I, have, I teach environmental science to, to um, undergraduates, and I struggle with the scientific literature, I'm technical enough, I'm trained as an applied mathematician, our failure to represent the climate scenarios in something as simple as once every 10 years, once every 20 years, once every 100 years for very particular events that matter to people. And that's the framing for all sort of climate futures that I think we should be striving for. Thanks very much indeed, Peter. And uh, the third of our first round of speakers um, is Anna Maria Hubert, who is uh, an associate professor in law at the University of Calgary and also has a position at the University of Oxford and was previously at the IAS in um, uh, Potsdam and has been thinking a lot about the way that geoengineering of various forms fits into current and future legal frameworks. So, Anna Maria. Um, so I'm gonna start um, with this map of the world and um, well, I'll start with the straw man really. So we've heard a lot of um, the perspective of climate modelers in particular who see um, the world and the relevant boundaries in terms of grid boxes. Um, and um, international legal scholars were concerned with political boundaries, so um, borders between um, sovereign states. And um, so to bring you in the dark place of the mind of a lawyer, I'm going to take you through um, some of the basic principles of the international legal system and the challenges that geoengineering poses, um, both in the long term but also in the short term, um, to um, international law. And then I'll end with some um, ideas about um, how the law needs to be um, changed or governance needs to be created to address some of these concerns. So um, in terms of structural principles and fundamental tenets of the international legal system, um, the international um, system was founded on the need to guide peaceful coexistence of a few subjects of international law based on the sovereign equality of states. So I thought this quote was apt. The system is ideally to keep its subjects peacefully apart that is to say, in a state of negative peace or the absence of war, it suffices to impose on them the obligation of respecting each other's sovereignty, not to encroach on other spheres of competence so that the conditions of equilibrium, equilibrium might be satisfied or at least not endangered. And it's important to point out that international law has developed from this fundamental premise to be more um, communitarian in nature. Nonetheless, the idea of um, of geoengineering appears antithetical to this idea of peaceful coexistence, not interfering in other people's states. So this idea of planetary scale in interventions in the environment of other states um, is a contrast. Um, and I think um, when we think about geoengineering, it's useful, um, even research, very small scale research, um, it's useful to think about the end aim um, in particular, given that um, although we can learn things about the environment, sort of fundamental things about the climate system, um, we're mostly talking about solar geoengineering in the context of missional driven research. Um, and if we were to assume that um, a deployment could be carried out in a way that's consistent with fundamental tenets of the international um, system, this would include respect for the sovereign equality of states, 
which implies a need to consent through, for example, a universal agreement or treaty, um, widespread cooperation and coordination, likely through international institutions um, over decades, so implying a degree of geopolitical um, stability within the international legal system. Um, and so scientists here have um, pressed the case, some scientists, about the urgency of starting outdoor re research given the climate risks that we're facing. I think the same case can be made from the governance side, namely that we're far from imp implementing this level of stable and sophisticated global governance. And to pro um, quote Professor Barrett, who's in the audience, governance is perhaps the greatest challenge when we talk about solar geoengineering. And so what are some of these challenges? This is a picture, and you can't really see it, but it's just to demonstrate. I, I, I drew this for a colleague of mine when I was working in Germany, who's a human geographer, and he's, he's interested in concepts of space in international law. And what we see here is um, that um, within the context of international law, we're interested in, uh, we have a number of different treaty regimes that um, govern um, different aims and goals and different um, subject matter. And also um, what's important is to consider where the activity is taking place. So we're concerned about jurisdiction when we apply the rules. And I think a number of jurisdictional issues arise, even with respect to um, smaller scale research. And we've seen this already in the case of ocean fertilization. So one idea is the, is the protection of the global commons. So um, research activities that, for example, take place beyond 200 nautical miles on the high sea where there's relatively few protections. Um, also the issue of foreign shopping. So looking for jurisdictions where the rules are lower or um, I guess less strict. Um, and that's also um, um, borne out already um, in the case of ocean fertilization, where Russ George um, first tried um, to um, conduct his ocean fertilization activities in the Galapagos, then moved to the Canaries, and finally carried out his, um, his research um, off the Canadian coast, um, where I'm from. So um, I think that we should assume um, also that we'll have um, activities taking place. So this is a forum about US solar geoengineering research. We can assume that activities um, may occur in other states as well. And would the US be interested in what's going on in some of those other countries? Um, we also have this problem of long-term um, regime interaction. So in international law, we call that regime fragmentation. Um, and so the, one of the concerns which um, may arise is that you'll have different sets of rules in international treaties um, for geoengineering that potentially conflict. So we've already seen action by um, the Convention on Biological Diversity in this area, um, albeit non-binding guidance, and also in the London Convention and Protocol, which um, regulates marine geoengineering, um, or will, um, if the amendment comes into force. Um, I think the other and the bigger risk really is that geoengineering um, will develop apart or separate from a wide body of international rules that govern the protection of the marine environment, um, sustainable development, and human rights, and that geoengineering as a concept could undermine this fragile but important system of international rules um, and cooperation that we have. Um, and so I think there's a need to consider how geoengineering governance fits within this um, existing ge um, regulatory context. Um, justice and equity. I think the equity issues on the long term, when we think about the termination effect, um, we can think about intr intergenerational equity. But I think intragenerational equity issues are most pressing now when we think of small scale research. And that includes. Um, a role for um, not only developed states, which clearly have a foothold in this area now, but developing states in um, defining research questions and whether they matter as well as civil society. Um, and I think that's a, another international interest that has to be addressed at the, um, in the near term. And finally, um, to build on Janosch's comments, I think there is really a lack of governance capacity um, in terms of knowledge of these issues um, within, at all levels, so international, 
national levels and within civil society. And um, so I think the need for educating states, um, government actors, as well as um, civil society on these actor, on, on geoengineering concerns is, is really quite important. And it's going to take significant time to build that capacity, um, also the scientific cooperation across um, borders. Um, that's um, a major issue. And I think one of the issues is that there's really a lack of demand pull from policymakers at all level in addressing these issues. And um, do I have like one more minute? Uh, no, but I will be. I will. I will give you will one. You I will call the dog. Is the dog going to bark? <laughs> That's my question. I just like to highlight um, some ideas about what early measures we can take to address this issue. So, a colleague and I, um, at when um, we were in Germany, um, wrote. Um, this is a 96-page paper, so <laughs> I apologize for the length. Sort of exploration of how um, international law could be developed to address. Some of these issues as I frame them today. Um, and um, the sort of bulk of the legal scholarship that um, existed before this sort of repeated this refrain that there's no international law that directly applies. But I think the point here is that there's a lot that we can draw from in terms of experience in other areas of the law um, and procedural mechanisms that could be adjusted and combined to um, address some of these issues. So um, the paper explores um, potentially applicable general principles um, that are consistent with international law, including the Paris Agreement. I think that's important, the relationship between mitigation and geoengineering. Best practices um, for outdoor research. Um, there are examples of instruments that do that, um, mainly in the marine context. And also issues of legal forms, so the need for an adaptable and flexible instrument, and also um, guidance that's not um, within the traditional domain of state actors, but also um, non-state actors such as businesses, scientific institutions, and individual scientists. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to start off the discussion by thinking back to some of the things that Rose said in the first session this morning about a space for critical reflection. And from the sort of like three different viewpoints that you took, how would you imagine research leading to the abandoning of this idea? Um, well, we, t we actually talk about that in the marine cloud brightening research effort because we had two and maybe three of the principals who originally joined the effort to disprove it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I think that, you know, when, when thinking about the research silos, um, there are actual real technical feasibility questions. They're different across the techniques, but we could actually run into some issues where it's, it's actually not that feasible to produce the kind of forcing that we want to do in a predictable way. And we look at it and we say, you know, we don't know yet if it's feasible. And we certainly don't know if it's feasible to do with benign materials in a predictable way. And so I think just from a practical perspective, that's certainly true. I think there are other things on the research path, if you look at marine cloud brightening, to say, well, do we know enough about whether we could get susceptible clouds in particular areas, for example? And, and we study it and we find, actually, no, we can't. So there are certainly scientific questions that could come into play we may learn more about what would happen to precipitation. And there would be scenarios that we say, no, these are unacceptable, or they're only acceptable in, under certain other extreme scenarios that we look at. So I think that if, 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 if we define the mission-driven research objective as a, a set of questions we want to answer in a certain period of time, you know, that's a framework where the wrong answers to those questions mean we don't proceed. And I think there are similar social science questions you know, Anna's point about whether this really does threaten the framework for mitigation in national policy, even at the research level, that's a really interesting question. We should look into that right away, you know, so. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge this idea of uh, the rational decision maker, especially given that we're in DC. I, I, I didn't impute, actually, <laughs> rational decision Yeah, makers. no, I know. So I, I, in contrast to... Um, um, the previous statement. I, I sort of think um, we we presume that if the science sort of shows that this is a bad idea, that that idea will you know will accept from the list of possible um, future activities that we can undertake and move on to more promising um, science. But I think 
Um, that may or may not be the case. Um, this isn't my really area of expertise, but I think like the idea that policy ma makers like make their decisions based on science in a sort of evidence-based way is a bit um, tenuous. And also, I think within the context of geoengineering, we've already seen like ocean fertilization has not gone away, even though the majority of scientific opinion is that it's not a good idea. Just um, a couple of weeks ago, a new company cropped up in Vancouver um, with kind of a new iteration of a scientific board and you know um, scientific principles and so forth by which they'll govern their activities. So I think you know the idea that it's not a it's not a viable option scientifically doesn't necessarily match up with whether it'll be pursued. Um, I, I think the sort of the three stages by which it, it could go away is first sort of an advanced public comment period by which the public could weigh in and say, these are the things we worry about. And then typically the response would be, we don't worry about them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and in fact, we'll show you that. And, and it, it's clear to me that, um, that field trials could show that um, that statement, we do not need to worry about them patently wrong. And it's the explicitness that helps on that, as opposed to being vague about it and the, and the preemptive public comment. The third way is there's often the claims, well, uh, this is going to help people or nations or something that are most at risk to the climate impacts. That's, a, you know, that's a, one of the arguments for geoengineering. That's something you can look at more carefully than just letting it be a glib statement. Uh, that was often the, the glib statement for the biotechnology. This is going to feed Africa. Um, and, but it was never really seriously investigated. You could seriously think about that uh, as you're developing it. So I think th those, those two questions, is it really going to help those who are most at risk? And show me that we don't not have to worry about it. Give you intervention points to turn it back. Okay. Any questions on this discussion so far? Um, and particularly on that idea, I'm, I'm intrigued by this idea of where obviously people do not think uh, that deployment is um, a certainty. Do people think that there is a chance of research on this subject just stopping? Um, is there anyone who thinks that or any other thoughts on these issues in this like legal systems and public perception framework that we've just been looking at? I'll take um, the first three are from um, Yes. Yes, no. Thanks, um, Holly Buck. Um, I was wondering this, uh, after hearing two papers, one was at AGU, um, which looked at the how species could adapt after a termination shock. And another was a recent paper that um, I don't think has been published yet, but has been presented about um, insulation impacts on major crop production, showing that solar geoengineering might be negative for, for world food production. And both of those made me think, oh, I, I didn't realize that there was a scientific uncertainty about that, number one. And then number two, how, much, how many more repeatable studies would we need on these types of things before we collectively decided not to research? And so my question is, um, should there be a systematic look at what would be the conditions to kind of falsify geoengineering as an idea? And in the absence of a coordinated government research program who might design it that way, could scientists self-organize to, to do something like that? Yeah, um, there and then up front. Oh, I'm going to use people's names. Yes, Sylvia, please, and then Mike, and then David. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Sylvia Ribeiro from ETC Group. Um, I think uh, th th this is not only about this panel, but I think that there are many things that are not being taken up here. <laughs> and one of them is that this is, a, this is a kind of a small group of friends that have been working with each other for some time. And if we are going to have a debate on geoengineering, this is not like the right <laughs> forum. We need a much wider forum. That is one thing. But the other thing is also that I am, um, as many times it happens, I am, I am uh, a bit, um, I don't know, very, not a bit, I am very concerned uh, that, for instance, 
uh, the, the, here it has been mentioned that some outdoor experiments are being planned, particularly David Keith, but also the, the, the cloud brightening experiments. And all those experiments, as far as I can see, they will be in violation of the Convention on Biological Diversity. The U.S. is not a signatory of, the, of that, but uh, even those will be, you know, not taking into account uh, the, the, the de facto moratorium on geoengineering engineering that, that the CBD has established. So for instance, uh, I think that is, that is a point. Then the, the third and last point is that I think that it won't be helpful with, which, with, with a technology that can be so powerful like geoengineering engineering to have this kind of, you know, um, uh, voluntary, friendly, code of conduct <laughs> kind of things. We really need real governance, and real governance is independent, is, is external to the people that are working on it. Either it is research or much, much more deployment, I mean, what we are not even speaking about. And because some of the fundamental questions, for instance, is do we really want to go this path? is not being taken here because we are just assuming that we have to compare this with climate change, but there are a lot of other alternatives. It's not only about geoengineering. There are a lot of other alternatives that are being left out. So that were my points. Thank you. Mike? And then very quickly from David, and then I'm going to go back to the panel on this. Um, the, the whole idea of experiments is that they won't be large enough to really do anything um, beneficial. Um, they'll almost always raise questions about something. Um, and so it's a little bit hard to see how, sometimes how you go ahead in doing something that might have very large net benefits later if it, in, if it were done at scale. So I, I guess I'm curious how you would even sometimes conduct experiments if, uh, if people are gonna always find problems with them, which they they will when there there's really no prospect of benefits at the experimental stage. I guess I'm trying to understand Anna Maria's opening statement. I think that Anna Maria, that you said that this is in some fundamental way incompatible with core principles of international law because of uh, it represents some action that affects other states. So I have several questions. I mean, I suppose that would also make any burning of fossil fuels or other things that affect other states illegal under international law. And, and you have a directionality question. So if one state puts CO2 in the atmosphere, which alters the radio forcing in another state, and then does solar geoengineering, which imperfectly and partially reduces that radio forcing, does the direction matter, or is anything you do incompatible with international law? OK. Uh take that one first since it was <laughs> nice and direct and at someone in particular um actually that's not what i i am um, asserting i guess my argument is if we wanted it to be consistent with sort of fundamental tenets of international law we would want an agreement we would want consent and some institutional um cooperation um and so forth i think um, so we, um, some colleagues and I in Germany, um, published a paper that examined whether um, a unilateral intervention by a state would contravene um, international law, customary international law. And um, yeah, I think the jury is out on that, probably not. So whether there would be enforcement at the international level by um, a unilateral action by a state, I think probably not. So um, I think my argument is not that um, that that somehow is incompatible international law. I think my argument is like if you wanted it to make it compatible with sort of core ideas of how the international system operates, you'd want these sort of fundamental um, I guess mechanisms in place. Could I ask you to address the CBD point as well? Yeah, so um, it's I think not true to say that there is a moratorium at the international level um, under the CBD. Um, so I have that decision in front of me. I think the main point is that it's a um, legally non-binding decision, and also um, there is an exception for small-scale research. And um, so, for example, this SOFAC ex experiment, small-scale, provided that um, it meets some of the other criteria in that decision, but it's not legally binding. So it's, it's really not a moratorium. 
Briefly, yes. Briefly, what is your answer? I don't think I think that I think that's that doesn't contradict what Anna Maria just said. Oh, thank you, Andrew. You want to? I just I, I I don't think we should spend too much more time on this, but I, I completely I would actually put it stronger than Anna Maria does. I look very closely at the three operative decisions by the CBD on this. This is in no way a moratorium. It's not a de, de facto moratorium. It's a call. It's a call. It's a call for transparency for countries to report what they're doing, which they have not complied with since the decision was made. Let's be very clear: with no penalty, we're not even complying with reporting on any research that they are doing. And secondly, that if this is done, then there's a whole laundry list of precautionary, you know, advisory things that you should take into account if you're thinking of doing this. That's what it is. I'm happy to go through very carefully those three decisions with anyone who'd like to go through. Okay, I just want to come back quickly on Holly and Mike's points about, is there an, is, is an interesting way of shaping um, a geoengineering research project looking for a falsification process, looking for reasons for saying, okay, let's not do that. Is that a useful way of going forward, path forward? Okay, Jane says yes. But. Well, it has to be part of it. I mean, I, I think that the, the, I was going to talk about it in my talk, but I'll say it now instead, that, you know, part of the issue is how do you charter an institution to do these, this research? What do you tell them you want them to do? And one of the things you really want these institutions to do is be able to tell you it's a bad idea. You, not, you don't want them to be so vested in the success of the idea that it gets into the slippery slope of lock, technical lock-in. So what has to happen is the charter has to include assessment and reward for saying this is, this is crap and you shouldn't do it. And that, 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 that's hard to do, and that, that's a challenge. Does anyone, can anyone on the panel offer examples of where that's been well done, where people have been rewarded for getting rid of crappy ideas? Um, <laughs> not necessarily crappy ideas. I mean, Spice didn't go ahead for various reasons. <laughs> you gave an example. You gave an example, yeah. Peter. You, you gave an example. You gave an example. Well, well, right. I mean, the, the farmer crops mm -hmm. was um, originally it was activists against it, but eventually the field trial was done. The claim was made we can contain them, and when it became the data were so unambiguous, you cannot contain the gene, and so it changed the whole actually changed the whole regulatory framework. I mean, that's also something you might want to consider in a governance framework is a requirement to produce negative results um, in terms of transparency. I think that's super important. Okay, I'm not going to um, bring us back in a little bit more with um, our last two panelists. Um, the first one of which is Andrew Light. I'm also bringing the dogs back um, at this point. Um, Okay, do you want to go first, Jane? No, no, no. It's just Seriously, do you want to go first? No. no. Okay, Andrew's then Andrew's going, going first. Um, I get the last uh, word. You do. You get the, you get, well, I'll probably get the last word as oh, it happens. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> is it going to be a dog or not? Uh, uh, but Andrew is, um, is, is, is very distinguished in many ways, um, some of them at the World Resources Institute. Um, he's also a professor at George Mason University and also a uh, distinguished career in the State Department negotiating deals about just this sort of thing. So, Andrew. Thank you. Um, so I want to say a, just a couple things at the top um, about the current state of play that weren't mentioned in the last session. Um, so two things that I think are relevant to our discussion. Number one, if I were to bet today on what the Trump administration is going to do on the Paris Climate Agreement, they will decide to stay in the agreement and then change the U.S. nationally determined contribution, the U.S. pledge, to 2025. So that's where I would put money down today. Um, we can talk more about why I think that's the case. Um, I would sort of think it's an exaggeration. Some of the media reports on this are somewhat exaggerated as sort of a Banca Trump versus Steve Bannon kind of thing. I don't think that's really happening. But I do think that there is a, um, that there is a, there's an emerging view that that's probably what they're going to do. At the same time, we know from the budget, with the release of the budget blueprint a um, uh, week before last, and um, from what we expect to be an executive order probably that will land on Tuesday on the Clean Power Plan and other rescinding other Obama era executive orders on resilience and other things, that they will, I will, they will effectively pull out of Paris even though they might actually legally stay in. And so I think that creates a very interesting set of uh, issues that we'll have to look at. Um, the other thing is that there is a lot of what I would call um, inno, inno, innovation noise, not innovative noise, but innovation noise that is accompanying what is this emerging 
decision around the Paris Agreement, which could, if it doesn't impact um, what the, this Trump, the Trump administration does with this, with respect to solar en geoengineering, if they do anything or anything else that's being talked about, I think there is going to be emerge some kind of cover under the guise of probably some kind of fossil fuel technology um, uh, strategy that will be sort of rolled out as what their contribution is going to be. There's a letter yesterday that was released by Kevin Kramer, Republican representative from North Dakota, who's actually been an advisor to the Trump team in the White House and in the campaign, which gives an indication of that. There's some good stories about that today we can talk about. Now, I think that sets up the, the following, I think, sort of scenarios in terms of what's going to go happen. And then what I would argue would be, when, firstly, with the scenario in terms of what I think will immediately happen with respect to this administration um, and the possibility of moving forward with respect to coordinated international action. And then what I would, I would actually advocate that we, those of us who would like to see our research agenda on geoengineering move forward. And more importantly, I think a, a governance discussion, a robust governance discussion move forward that doesn't interfere with innovation. But in fact, I actually think in, in a way that we've learned from the examples that Peter gave may actually make uh, um, some kind of research more uh, plausible and um, possible. Um, so I, 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 everyone who said today that they think that Trump will not do anything on this, no one in, in, the, in the US federal government will do something on it, I think that's right. There is, however, this interesting phenomenon, which is quite different than the Obama years. At the beginning of the Obama administration, all eyes expected that you know, Obama would do something on climate change, which he did. And at the very beginning, many of you were involved in, in some of these discussions, John Holdren tried to organize some discussions, right, on climate engineering that, that frankly got shut down from the environmental left. Um, I think there is actually probably room at this point that there might be a very quiet discussion, not involving principals, not involving members of the cabinet, that there might be room for a discussion of actually talking about, seriously, about governance, which we were never able to do, governance issues on geoengineering, which we were never able to do in the State Department when I was in office because, frankly, we were just too busy trying to get the Paris climate deal done. We had no capacity to work on this. But there are a lot of people who are still around who are going to have their budgets mightily slashed, and they're still going to need something to do. And this is a time <laughs> where they could potentially gin up a very quiet debate, and I think it might actually advance things once we get back to an administration who gets serious about this problem again, and then we would actually have something keyed up to move forward to, and there are some ways we can do that. I think there was a signal of that, potentially unintentionally, in the midterm report that was released by the, by the US GCRP, um, where you get the sort of the shout out to the need for thinking about that, and I think we can imagine that happening even under the context of the National Climate Assessment. Um, I think that in terms of what I would like, I would act, I would sort of want to see happen internationally with or without the US is I think it's absolutely critical, and this was mentioned in the last panel, that we get to transparency. Uh, the CBD decision, if it would cause countries to actually dig down and be public about what they're spending now on this, we have some vague numbers, we can go through the public databases, we can kind of get a sense of what's going on here in Germany, the EU, a couple other countries, China, India, now it looks like it's going to fund its first project. So if that, if that, if that, if that process had actually resulted in public reporting, that would have been great. And we need to encourage that. And part of the reason I think it needs to be encouraged is because it is critically important to me that climate engineering not be this discussion that happens separate of all other discussions of mitigation scenarios. I think it has to be integrated in order for us to ever have a rational conversation about whether we would ever want to do it and under what circumstances. So to that degree, I would, I would advocate for two things. Inside the framework convention, um, those of you who know the Paris Agreement, uh, one of the things that we did is not only set up a continual process for people putting up pledges, so by 2025, we will get into these annual five-year cycles of countries going forward and putting forward new pledges, we hope, with more ambition. And part of that was also creating something called the global stock take. So just a couple of years before, right, those commitment periods, you do, an, you do a, a big report on the, the world of hazard and opportunity. Where are we in terms of temperature? Where are we in terms of mitigation scenarios? Where are we in terms of hazards? And importantly, we, we, those of us who created it wanted to create it not just as a stick, but also a carrot. Ideally, the global stock take, when it happens, will also describe what is the remaining low-hanging fruit out there? What are the technology opportunities that people don't understand that could cause them to choose to increase their ambition in the future because they do not realize how, that it could actually be cheaper than they imagine? Now, I think optimally, the global stock take needs to look at everything, all technology options, including solar engineering. This would also be an opportunity to get more transparency from parties on what they're actually funding, either under the official title of solar geoengineering or something else. 
And the way that you would, mo the best, I think, way of doing that is there will be sort of a, I like to think of it as sort of a trial run of the global stock take in 2018, which goes by the ungainly title of the 2018 Facilitative Dialogue. And if we can get uh, this technology and, a, and an assessment of this technology included in the 2018 Facilitative Dialogue, it then will become part of the global stock take. If we don't hit that marker, I think we can still do it, but it will take some effort. It will take the effort of parties obviously coming aboard. The second way that I would suggest doing this is outside the framework convention, and again, looking at it as a technology option. There are two prime candidates for this. The Clean Energy Ministerial, which was created as an offshoot of the Major Economies Forum, which was a, originally a Bush-era process, which collects together the 20 top emitters in the world. It sort of mirrors the G20. And out of that, in the first Obama term, we spun out a companion um, set of meetings with the energy ministers. So they would have some stake, right, in, uh, in, in global climate policy. Very successful in terms of a process. Doesn't include anything on these technologies. Certainly could be included. And I think you've got a smaller number of parties, so it's less unwieldy, I think, than the framework convention in terms of getting, you know, to move from talk shop to actually doing something that's a little bit more coordinated, especially on the governance side. The other opportunity is the uh, something called Mission Innovation, which was also launched just before we started the formal negotiations around Paris. And this is around 20 countries who are who have pledged to double their uh, non-fossil energy budgets, right, by 2020. Um, I think the U.S. is, oddly enough, I think we're probably going to formally stay in that, even though we will not hit the target, given what the uh, what looks like the, what the Trump administration would like to do to the DOE budget. The last thing I want to say is, last thing, is there is a scenario, I think, and, and this, is, this is the speculative part of what I'm going to say, more speculative than the other stuff. There's a scenario where I actually do think there's a possibility that this administration does move forward and that it creates something that will necessitate an international response. And that's if we get a second Trump term. If we get a second Trump term, and it's got to be considered, folks, you've got to be, you've got to be thinking about what are the possibilities here if you're interested in the marathon, which is global policy on climate change. If there is a second Trump term, one way or the other, um, if there's a second Trump term, then you've got a White House which is no longer thinking about re-election immediately, number one. Number two, you've got a White House with no heir apparent at all. I think Trump is, you know, unless he succeeds in, in re recreating the Republican Party as purely a populist party, there is no one who pass, he's passing the baton to. Ivanka, Ivanka. In that, in that, in that, thank you. Thank you. Now you've, now I will not get any sleep tonight. So, thank you. The, the, under those conditions, I think we could see something that happens like we saw in the second term of the Bush administration. In the second term of the Bush administration, we saw after relentless calls on the Bush administration to re-engage on climate policy, they finally decided to do it because it was causing them too much collateral damage in terms of everything else that they wanted to do. So they finally did. It was orchestrated mostly by Tony Blair in a push of the, uh, the Glen Eagles G20. And after that, you got the Bush administration creating the Major Economies Forum, getting behind the creation of the Climate Investment um, Fund in the World Bank, which was a, you know, the, our first big international um, climate finance uh, uh, fund, um, and a number of other things. The first time they finally sort of declared that climate change was real, and like there are many other things that happened there. There will be pressure, mostly from the G20 parties, for Trump to uh, eventually kind of rejoin the committee on this. In that term, you could imagine that this is one of the things they decide to do. They decide to, to basically um, a join, a, create a small coalition of countries who want to do that. I think that at this point, if I were to predict, if this happens, no matter what they do, I think it involves most likely Russia and the Saudis. We will see at the G20 this July whether an, an, you get an emergence of a Russia, US, Saudi Arabia axis on global climate policy, saying no, we've already seen an indic indication of this at the G20 finance minister's meeting a couple weeks ago when they took um, uh, fulfilling the, the finance goals in the UNFCCC all out of the communique coming out of that. And if that happens, then I think that this becomes, in a weird way, this becomes their kind of signal of innovation and then I think we need, are we really back in the sort of the, the scenario where we think about who takes money, who doesn't, like to what degree are we pushing back or actually trying to put this into a bigger context? Gosh, thank you, Andrew. Um, <laughs> I think that's the phrase I was on. Yes, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Jane. Can you start the dogs barking now? Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we need them. I never contemplated uh, eight years. 
um, I don't want to contemplate eight years, but I do think that the idea, one of the ideas I do want to play off on um, is this idea that you have this hiatus of rationality and that, that it is an opportunity to really think carefully about how you would go forward. And so I feel like it's really important to stick to our guns about what we've been thinking is important and to do and to do right. And that, um, I, I don't believe in the kind of relativism that, you know, now that, the, you know, I, I actually don't think I believe that if Trump comes up with money for geoengineering research that we should automatically reject it because it's Trump. I think that if it's the right thing to do, we should take the money. If it's asking us to do things we don't think are right, then we shouldn't do it. And I, I think that's the, that's the way we ought to think about it. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I think um, uh, someone's, whoever is going to start research and serious research, not, you know, just sort of one-off stuff and not just modeling, but actually getting out in the field. What, what you need to think about, what are some of the things that you should be putting um, into your design of this research program programmatically? And the first thing I want to um, dwell on is that, that, that we know that geoengineering is fundamentally strategic. It, it, it fundamentally requires, at least at the global level, and I, I think, just to interrupt myself, I think I agree with Scott um, this morning when he talked about the fact that geoengineering is liable to emerge as a lot of regional actions that grow larger and larger. So everything I'm saying, uh, every argument I'm making right now has a, has a kind of um, counterpoint in that scenario, which is I actually do believe is in reality more likely and has to be thought through. But back to this idea of global geoengineering, which may grow towards that um, regional concept. Uh, I think this is, fun it, it, it nevertheless, is fun fundamentally strategic. You have a goal that you want to achieve. You decide on actions. You take the actions. You have some procedure for saying how you're going to say whether uh, it's going in the right direction or not, what you want to stop, you want to keep going. And and the thing that the, the attribute of that is that we have been unable on a global level or on pretty much any level to be strategic about climate. And so I think that this understanding of, of, of geoengineering as a, as, a, um, as a strategic action means that we should do everything we can to keep the research on geoengineering in the context of all the tools that we have at our behavior. And, and at our, our, at, our, our at hand, or that we wish we had at hand. And so I am against, very much against, what Janie Wise said about separating this out. I am very much against separating the governance of these two things. I am, a, I am, I believe that we can best keep this technology in the context, in the right context of how it should be used by including as much as we possibly can in that governance regime. And it may be different but, and I think once you have it under the umbrella, you can say this is low risk and we'll move out under the low risk scenario, whatever is low risk, and this is high risk, whatever is high risk. And don't forget that many of the CDR technologies are going to require putting that carbon dioxide someplace, and that aspect of it is not going to be necessarily low risk. So I think that we, we should keep that strategic context in mind. Secondly, I think that it's incredibly important that we start to learn about governance at the same time we're starting to learn about geoengineering and that we do it while the risks are low. So if we have experiments like we heard about this morning from Tom and David, where these are very low physical risk experiments, this is the time to start putting certain attributes of governance in place because you can imagine if, if you finally do get to the place in research where there is some risk, if you haven't put some of the basic elements together and exercised them and gotten those muscles toned up, how you would possibly uh, address some, some aspect that had real risk in it. So I think the beginning of this should go through, one of the first things I think you can do to address that issue is, is to have an independent advisory board. And that independent advisory board can help to put a lot of things in place uh, to start to learn about the things that we need. For example, I'll, I'll talk about some of them, but how are you going to be transparent is, is, a, is a not necessarily an obvious question. How are you going to have deliberation between you and society? Uh, how are you going to assess the research? How are you going to know that it's, it's, it's reliable? So let's talk about some of those things. Um, let's talk about reliable research. So we think we need to have 
institutions set up that are going to produce research in a way that we find reliable. Let me talk about just a couple of those. One of the most important ones to me is transparency. What is transparency? It is not releasing your data, not telling everybody you're doing an experiment. It is having information available in a way that is that will uh, facilitate understanding and dialogue. And I like to call it meaningful transparency. So it is designed to get a uh, to develop trust in the research. So you need to talk about what you need to be clear about what the intent of the research is, why you're doing it the way you're doing it, what the quality of your information is, what you hope to learn. What are the research questions you're trying to answer? And those those questions, for example, become a really wonderful fulcrum for a discussion with the with the public. It is that place where the public can engage. If you say, I'm, I'm putting sulfur in the atmosphere so I can understand particle size and do some of the things that Joyce was talking about, the public will probably come back and say, but I want to know if I'm going to have to breathe it. Can you answer that question? And sometimes they, they will actually also question your methods. And that, though, that dialogue about what your methods is, why you're doing it, why you understand what you do is very important. Secondly, and I think this is a discipline that we absolutely have to have in this field, is that we have to predict the results of every experiment a priori and compare the results to what we predicted. This is the reason. We are never going to know everything about this. We are never going to know how to do this perfectly. The best we can hope for is that we have some kind of accuracy in our understanding of what direction it's going to go, and, that, and some confidence that we understand accurately. So as we move through experiment by experiment, and we predict them, we predict the results, and we compare, if we get better and better at predicting these experiments, we're going to have a sense that we kind of know what direction things are going to go. If we don't, if the, if the corn gets out, we know that it's bad. And so this discipline of formally saying, here is what I, I'm do here's the experiment I'm doing, and here's the, here's the result I expect, and then formally showing how that, um, that's the dog, huh? OK, I'm going to say one more thing about this. So the peer review process needs to be amped. I won't talk about that. I just want to talk about one other thing that I think is critical, and that um, Kelly did such a good job, I'm not going to have to say much. The mission-driven research has to be reinvented. We did mission re reinvented. Uh, this has to be mission-driven research that is based on systems analysis, as Kelly did a beautiful job explaining what that is this morning. But we haven't been doing that very well in this country. It's at least here. I don't know about other countries. We haven't. Uh, we've lost that. We did it in the Cold War, and we made a mess. We've done it. Um, we, there were recently examples from NSF. Um, I don't know if any of you followed the NEON program, National um, Ecological Observation Network. It was uh, funded as a mission-driven research project. It was uh, became aggrandizement of the company that that want that was formed to do it. It was uh, there was no communication between up bottom and top. We we need to have something that's that uh, has a systems approach that defines the system, defines the uh, the components that have to be researched, just like like Kelly did, and is allowed to also bring forward the ideas from the bottom to the top of the organization and good communication. The attributes of this need to be studied. We need to look back at things that were good and bad and redesign it. OK, thank you very much, Jane. I want to come in directly with a question on that. What examples do we have of mission-driven research done in a non-governmental context? Non-governmental? Yeah. And given there's been a lot of discussion about, A, the unlikelihood that there will be a large government program, B, the difficulty about a large government program or any government program at a time when the same government is cutting um, other parts of the climate research agenda, is there any, can you point to anything that suggests this mission-driven uh, approach having a, pub having a public, not private sector success? That's a really good question. I guess I would start to look at some of the big corporations and companies that had big mission-driven research programs. But for, I, for specific I private would, goals. I would argue driverless cars. I mean, if we're looking at something that has you know, a lot of science, big systems approach, is being done in the private sector, is mission-driven, is risky, um, it's being done at scale or it's being proposed at scale, and it's, it's almost entirely private sector. 
Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to take questions now. Um, I'm going to take you first because you got shut down last time, and I'm going to take Ted second. Thank you, Roger Cook Resources for the Future. I just like us to remember Star Wars. I think you were referring to this. All of the, this was Regan's initiative with uh, Death Stars and, and ray guns and weaponized satellites. All of the scientists at the beginning said, this is a bad idea, it won't work. And then he put out a pot of money and suddenly people started saying, well, okay, maybe we can do something. So, and uh, just putting that out there. Uh, thank you. I want to pick up on the, the last two panelists. Um, so I, I, I won't comment on Andrew's uh, uh, two terms that frighten everybody, but I will say this. I believe that there is a non-trivial case that um, this White House comes around on climate change much sooner, meaning in the first term. And the case is the following. It is that, A, the business community in America wants ac action on climate change very clearly. Most of the, bit, the most of the large companies are international. They have customers. They want that. Number two, if there's anything to be learned from today's debacle in the healthcare debate, it's the Republicans will learn they cannot repeal a major program area without replacing it with something better. There is no issue in America today where there's a broader gap between the Republican base and the Republican leadership than climate change. And the what what they are doing right now is such an overreach. It's Pruitt bull in the China shop in, in the EPA. It will cause a backlash. And when that backlash comes, the question will be, what is the Republican replacement program for, for what they have now, which is a repeal-only strategy? And there are only two things that they can do. They're not going to go back to, to Obama-style regulations. They're either going to go with a market-based climate policy, or they're going to go with some interest in geoengineering or both. So I think that there's a, a near-term case. And then finally, I wanted to mention just on, on Jane's comment of, of the advisory board, having listened to everything today, if there's one thing that I think this whole community could do to validate the field, it would be to go with that idea of an advisory board, but in a specific way. Bring together elder statesmen, former heads of state, who have ultimate credibility, who have time on their hands, and who could, just by convening around this, bless the idea as a serious topic, help you develop the government structures. That would be a very concrete umbrella to move this forward. Okay, Ted, and then, did I see Tom's hand? Yeah, um, Tom, no, 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 back here, Lizzie, Tom, but Ted first. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to highlight something that has been said repeatedly over the course of the day that I have the impression that at a level of a superficial slogan, everybody agrees very forcefully on. But I want to press to more specificity and suggest some disagreement that underlies and press to more specificity. The statement is, Jane said it nicely, it's imperative that we do everything possible to keep all research on geoengineering in the context of a complete climate response. So, yes, I think everybody said that. But consider the range of implied consequences that we've heard over the course of the day. We've heard at least two or three people, including Rose on the panel, Sylvia, and I think a couple of others, suggest that there's a, an intrinsic structural inability to do that as long as you're talking about geoengineering, and so to talk about geoengineering is basically improper. At the other extreme, it seems to me there might be something like a reflexive formal recognition. It's like that once you've genuflected in the direction of the importance of mitigation, you can sort of concentrate on what you're doing to try to contribute to solve the problem. I just want to point out there's a huge range of contradiction among those interpretations of almost the same statement, and the only way I can think of to resolve or reconcile them is to move to the level of specifics. And so my question to the panel is, I bet you all agree with that. If you wanted to take that really seriously and take it on board, what concrete, specific things should some identifiable person or actor, maybe somebody in this room, do now to do it more effectively than we're already doing it? Because everybody's certainly paying, not, not just lip service, sincere, intense homage to this before they start talking about geoengineering. Okay, due warning panel, that's going to be the last question that you'll answer, but I'm going to take some more from the floor anyway. Uh, Tom. Okay. So quick response to the comment earlier about scientists and pots of money. It wasn't the scientists that responded to the pots of money, it was industry, particularly the defense industry. The scientists mostly still swore off. The question that I have, and it's something that really concerns me, is if we start down this, this path, 
how do we maintain some separation from that pot of money in the industrial complex? I don't know the answer to that, but it worries me a lot. Okay, I think uh, there's a question down at the back, Paul. Oh, yeah. And anyone else should weigh very, very vigorously now. Jane. Hi. Um, okay, Jane. Paul Bledsoe, I just wanted to make a quick comment, which is that I think the American public doesn't believe that climate change is a problem. And so... Can you hold the bike up a bit, Paul? Um, I don't believe the American public thinks climate change is a very serious problem right now. Um, and I think that that's our biggest problem. Uh, you know, um, despite the fact that Louisiana floods are made twice as likely because of climate change and cost the taxpayer $12 billion, people don't know that. And so I think the biggest uh, hurdle is to show the true cost of climate change. Two thirds of the Forest Service budget goes to fighting fires. All these very practical things that are happening. And until we educate the public and uh, governors, civil society, uh, about the true nature of the problem, I, I just think that, that you're never going to gain public consent for that. Okay, Jane? Um, Jane Flagel, UC Berkeley. So I was really interested in Peter's um, discussion about the potential parallels with biotechnology. Um, and I think you talked a bit about the unwillingness of the community advocating for GM at that time to open the conversation up to broader ethical, political, and social concerns. But it strikes me that there's another risk, which is what folks like Dan Sarowitz have called the scientization of politics. And David actually hinted at this earlier. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering if, oh, David Goldston's term, not, not Dan Sarowitz's term. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if, so as an example, if you, if I might ask you in the biotech case, if you think that highly rigorous scientific studies of the ability of biotechnology to feed Africa had been conducted, um, to what extent do you think that would have addressed con broader social and political concerns or quelled broader political debate? And what might we take from your answer to that question about geoengineering? Okay, Peter, you take that one first, and then. So, uh, if, you know, on the academy, when we discussed the report we just came out with, um, it was clear that the ethical debate and much of the de debate was about value. So it, it couldn't, science had nothing to do with that, but you had to allow that conversation to, to happen. But to speak to your Africa issue, I think if, if there had been um, sort of serious data collected and research done to say what happens to small farm holders and what happens to that community, to even consider that in advance, to consider that scenario, say, not what happens to a, you know, a company's profits, but what happens to the small land, small holders uh, ability to use this technology. If that had been asked from the beginning, it would have changed it would have changed some of the scenarios, and it certainly would have changed the information we have available now, which is pretty skimpy to even, you know, address those questions, which still lurk. Andrew, did you want to come back on that, or did you want to come back? No, I want on... to talk about the two Teds. Okay, uh, on well, the Ted one then first, because I'm going to come back for everyone on Ted two. Okay, all right. So Ted for Ted one. Uh, sorry, Ted. <laughs> it's a compliment. So, um, I, look, I, of course, I hope you're you're right. I, of course, I hope you're right. And I applaud the work that you guys have done on this. It's extraordinary. Um, three problems, three big hurdles. Number one, I agree there's a business community out there voice on this. I agree that they have an active ear or audience in the White House, mostly around the National, National Economic Council. <coughs> um, but you've got to worry about like the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, <laughs> one of your biggest hurdles there. We've just released a report that compliance with the Paris Agreement would cost the United States $10 trillion, right? $10 trillion. Now, this is a little you know, evil genius on my shoulder. Was I started doing back of the envelope calculations. What kind of policy could I design of any sort that would cost $10 trillion? That's, that's actually an interesting yeah, that challenge. That takes us back to Star Wars. Right, exactly right, exactly right. So 
so that's a big hurdle. Is that there's there's a lot of noise out there in terms of that, that the messenger. Secondly, um, Steve Bannon and the Breitbart people have either got to be completely sidelined because Trump's uh, 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 popularity ratings just plummet, or decide for some reason not to get it all involved in on this in this debate. And third, I think the problem is getting Congress and whether or not this administration be willing to go to war with Congress to try to force the coalition between Republicans and Democrats to do something like the proposal you guys put forward. So that's all I'll say on that. But I do think that there, I totally agree with you, there's some room for something out there. And we've got to be very careful about how we sort of, what we're applauding and what we're not. Right. Um, does anyone want to come in on the idea of elder statesmen or the rather despairing point from Paul that people still don't know uh, before we go to Ted's well, question? I, well, oh. I, I, I want to do both at the same time. Okay. So, so I think that one of the really important things about geoengineering is that it is a fulcrum around which you can engage that conversation. That once you, once you bring up the idea that we might have to do this, I think I wrote a paper on this called Frankenstein's Academy. I mean, it's just like, it, it, it basically it gets people's attention that things are bad. And so we have to use it that way, which is another reason why we need to keep this context broad and not divided up into academic uh, reductionist research projects. And uh, to Ted's point then, for example, I think this is hard. And I think that I'm really impressed. Yeah, with the impression, I mean, there are examples. Like I think the stuff that Doug uh, McMartin and, and Kate Rickey are, are doing, for example, where they're looking at how the knobs of geoengineering turn uh, effectively, given different scenarios on mitigation and adaptation, how how do you? They're they're actually couching their understanding, um, and and I think Kate showed you some similar things with all those little graphs. But it gets complicated. It gets hard. But we need to think about this all the time. If you're a program manager, how would you define the mission of the program, and how would you ensure that the context is kept broad? And that I don't think that's just something you can answer glibly right now. I think what it is, is a area of focus. How do we do that? Because it's important to do it. Andrew. I'm answering Ted's second question. On Ted's second question, yeah. We're on if to Ted's it, second. The, the dogs are at our heels, I assure you. Yeah, if I understood the question correctly, it was sort of very specific recommendations on how to advance the... the right. I, th I think that I did that in my comments. I, th I think that I did that, and I think that, that so I sort of said, look, in, inside the framework convention, we need to get geoengineering considered among the suite of indicators that are going to be looked at for the global stock take, and, that, and I think that the first pass at that is the 2018 facilitative dialogue. This is one of the recommendations that I believe that those of us who are working on the uh, American University um, Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment report on governance, it's one of the things that we are you know, coalescing on making it, that recommendation. Um, We'll see whether it, it survives at the end of the day, but I think it will. Um, and then also using these techno these other you know um, clubs of countries that are have already been established that were part of how we got Paris across the finish line, which is where you can actually I think insert this and kind of mainstream it, mainstream it in there. And I think it has to be. And it's not going to be the only time. Look, in those conversations, we get discussions of things that people don't like that there is not unanimity on: nuclear power and carbon markets. A lot of people don't like carbon markets, folks. I mean, for the reasons that were mentioned on a previous panel, and when the um, clean development mechanism was first uh, was first uh, 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 um, articulated, it was thought to be the sort of this big, you know, cop out by developed countries to get away from their obligations. That's still out there, but you don't need agreement on the technology pathway or the or the policy instrument in order to want to mainstream it within the broad discussion on that. And I think those are the forums where you do it. Peter, I want to come to you again, Ted specific point about situ specific things people can do to situate geoengineering within a complete climate response? Well, it hasn't really been addressed in the IPCC reports. But so it's coming. so you, you could put it in two ways. It, 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 and you could put it in, in, in the scenarios, but you could also put it in the, in the impacts. So you could have uh, geoengineering as an impact of climate change in terms of a response. And both of those ways of putting it in uh, where I think situated. Um, there is a working group emerging for the next IPCC report with geoengineering as a cross-cutting topic. So I think it will it will start to emerge there. Um, so uh, from from my point of view, I guess I'm, I'm really heartened to hear about the stock taking report because I think putting things in the context of relative risk 
Um, geoengineering is a component of a portfolio of relative risk. And if you take something like sea level rise and, and you know, talking to the general public and policymakers and our, and, and our choices are managed retreat, there are highly engineered attempts to thwart sea level rise or their geoengineering. And if there are other options, obviously, obviously whatever mitigation trajectory we're on, but, but these, these relative risk contexts, the, the more work we can do there, that keeps geoengineering as part of a portfolio. And, and if, a, if other parts of the portfolio have better relative risk, then, then by God, we should do them. Um, we just need to understand the risk profile of this one. Um, I agree that there's um, an institutional context um, to this, but I think also we can think about um, rules and principles of international law and how they could be um, reinterpreted and applied in, in a particular context. So when we think about, for example, um, Article 4.1 of the Paris Agreement that states are supposed to um, reach um, a global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions, we can think about how that um, objective, since it's a bit soft, how that goal um, maps on to geoengineering and could be interpreted in that context. And I'll, I'll provide you with an example. When we talk about emissions, that's defined as a, as a release of gases. And I was involved in the London Protocol negotiations leading to the <coughs> on marine geoengineering. And so, um, though this isn't quite the language um, that I suggested, um, there's a, a, an idea inserted in the preamble that says that emphasizing that ocean fertilization and other types of marine geoengineering should not be considered as a substitute for mitigation measures to reduce carbon dioxide and emissions. And in a meeting um, subsequent to that, in fact, the Saudis were there arguing that, um, you know, they have a right to develop and, you know, their economy is based on oil and therefore they should um, be allowed to use geoengineering um, as, a, as an option to maintain business as usual. So I think these kinds of principles would be um, really helpful. And so um, defining general abstract principles in relation to international environmental law would be really important. Okay, thank you all very much. I'm actually going to abuse my chair position to give my answer to Ted's point, which is um, when prominent people in the environmental movement see people make claims about the impossibility or otherwise of the 2 degree and 1.5 degree targets with no mention of geoengineering whatsoever, they should say something rather than just letting it slide. Um, I'm, so I'm going to end on that one. Um, that was blatant editorializing. I'm now going to give Gerno two whole minutes to wrap up um, the, the meeting. Thank you all very much indeed. You're not going to play the dog today. Huh? You're not going to do the dog. Yeah? I cancel the dogs. We were way past the dogs. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, especially, uh, I guess, on this, even for DC, unusually crazy day. It's amazing to have so many of you here. I guess you all consider this sort of a retreat from, from a serious uh, debate outside. So I won't attempt to summarize or do much uh, uh, substantive. Uh, maybe just two very quick points. Right. Context matters. We've heard about this over and over again, versions of context. Right? Without it, solar geoengineering, you can describe it in various terms, some profound, some profane. Um, context matters. Second bit, um, Steve Hamburg sitting right here, and I guess I'm now revealing that I did spend uh, eight years out of the past ten uh, at EDF myself, most recently as the lead economist. Um, the EDF statement, right, ignorance is our enemy. Yes. Research matters, which is, of course, exactly um, why we are here. Um, and I mean, frankly, what's interesting to see is sort of this ecosystem developing, ecosystem of researchers, institutions, right? Janos Pashtor's uh, C2G2 initiative, uh, UCLA School of Law, uh, Ted Parsons initiative, um, lots of open questions, frankly, this is probably the best time to introduce very quickly, very briefly, our Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program. Lots of open questions, lots of reasons for debate, inclusiveness, transparency. I guess the one bit where we have put our stake in the ground is with the name, right? Albedo modification, climate engineering, lots of other names. We did, in fact, I guess admittedly consulting a couple of you, some of you, um, decide to name it the Solar Geoengineering Research Program. Um, two quick bits. We heard a bit, quite a bit, today about Frank Koch, David Keith's proposed 
uh, small scale flight experiment. Just to try to put that in a bit of context, yes, it is an important element. It's well, the sexiest sounding uh, proposal, proposed research, uh, in fact, happening. It is one of many uh, proposed research projects, research ideas um, like that. Only one of many. There are several, about a dozen Harvard faculty involved, students, postdocs from all across the university. Increasingly, of course, we are trying to get many, many others involved. Just one quick example. One very concrete thing that we are about to roll out is a residency program within our research program, uh, inviting uh, postdocs, junior, senior faculty, researchers from all sorts of institutions to come work with us. Doesn't have to mean you. Uh, doesn't mean you have to agree with us. Quite frankly, it is very, very healthy to have folks come in who strongly disagree with certain things we are doing. In fact, that's the point of having um, a residency program like this. Which is my last point now. I'd like to point you to our website, where both this, these proceedings were live streamed today. We'll have an archive of today up there, and very soon uh, this report as well, which for now is still only available to participants. There are no secrets in there, just some copy editing errors, essentially. So we will get our act together and have an edited version of this very soon on our website, geoengineering.environment.harvard.edu. Cookies and coffee outside. Thank you very much.